Hi everybody and welcome to this documentary on Timeline. My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. The enormity of total war is expressed in terms of the destruction of life, land and property by the narratives of attack and defence, victory and defeat. But the effect of war, the impact on nations, borders, politics and population is another story. And that story, viewed from the 21st century, suggests that the most influential battlefield of the Second World War was not Europe or the Middle East, North Africa or the Pacific. It was the Oriental battlefield. It was China, where war raged for years longer than anywhere else. A war that caused suffering on a scale and often of a brutality that it is almost impossible to comprehend. Caused more casualties than anywhere else and was the war that changed the world. The British began the first opium war in 1840 and initiated what the Chinese themselves call a hundred years of humiliation, which climaxed on the 18th of September 1931 when Japanese troops stationed in northern China under unequal treaties launched their invasion of the region of northeastern China known as Manchuria. That invasion became the war which did not end until the defeat of Imperial Japan in 1945. 14 years of pain and ruin. And yet, in 1972, Chairman Mao Zedong was not entirely joking when he asked Tanaka Kakue, the visiting Japanese Prime Minister, whether he should thank him for the invasion, because it had inspired China's national awakening and changed the destiny of China. This story explains how. The world knows that in a rich history stretching back thousands of years, Imperial China enjoyed a highly developed society. So many of the ordinary things of our daily lives originated in Imperial China. From a postal service to paper money, from porcelain to gunpowder, from tea to silk. And yet, it was Europe that invented the modern world. In 1793, Britain dispatched one more mission, hopeful of encouraging China to open its borders to trade. Lord McCartney took 600 packages of gifts from his monarch, the king of the red-haired people of England, the Chinese said. Their emperor's reply was, I set no value on strange or ingenious objects and have no use for your country's manufactures. The fate of Imperial China was sealed. By 1931, almost 150 years later, imperialist pressure, foreign troops and colonialist gunboats had changed China. Unequal treaties forced the Chinese to grant concessions and there were international settlements where British, French, German, Russian, American and others lived. After thousands of years, the last imperial dynasty fell and for 20 years, 
a turbulent China struggled to establish an effective Republican government. Into this turmoil stepped an Asian country that had not made the mistake that China made when faced by Lord McCartney. Japan's response to demands that had opened itself to trade was to embrace the necessity and modernize in a rush beneath the slogan, Fukoku Kyohei. Enrich the state, strengthen the military. In little over 70 years, it had remade itself as a significant modern military power. What Japan needed was room for its people and resources that were so lacking in its home islands. It turned itself into a colonial power. The Ryukyu Islands, the Chinese island of Taiwan, and the Korean Peninsula had been taken, and Japanese eyes were firmly on China. On the 18th of September, 1931, Japanese troops deliberately fabricated an incident that they used as a reason for taking over the whole of the northeastern region. Japanese troops are steadily advancing into Manchuria and occupying towns and villages. A population preyed upon by bandit overlords and baptized in military brigandage crowds the highways and attempts to flee. The Japanese renamed Manchuria Manchukuo and set up a puppet regime, installing the last emperor of China as its nominal ruler and defying the sanctions of the League of Nations. China has long been derelict in her international duties as a sovereign state, and Japan as her nearest neighbor has been the greatest sufferer on that storm. I ask you not to adopt this people for the sake of peace in the Far East and for the sake of peace throughout the world. The invasion of Manchuria in 1931 was the beginning of what China calls the War of Resistance Against Japanese Aggression. We cannot understand the course of a war that was, according to official government figures, to claim 35 million Chinese lives and be the anvil on which the new China was forged. Without understanding both the physical and the political landscape that the fighting was to so transform. China's natural wealth was then limited to the east and central parts of the country, the fertile river valleys and the hinterland of its great trading ports. This is the China that, in the war ahead, would suffer most from invasion and destruction. China's landscape is vast and diverse, as is its population, 400 million when Japan made her move a population made up of 56 nationalities. When Japan advanced, more than 80% of that population comprised rural peasantry, substantially illiterate. After full-scale war had started in 1937, a traveler entered a village near Beijing to warn of the Japanese advance. The villagers knew nothing of the Japanese. They did not even know that the imperial dynasty had fallen many years earlier. This was the China that was drawn into conflict from 1931 to 1945. The two great Asian powers had already fought each other. The first Sino-Japanese War of 1894-5 had been short and decisive. A Japanese victory that had cost China numerous concessions, including Taiwan and the Pescadores. <laughs> 
The history of the Chinese emperors is patchy, but it is a coherent history, and the fall of the emperor which followed defeat in the first Sino-Japanese war was bound to usher in a period of trial and error. It started when Dr. Sun Yat-sen declared a republic. He was soon chased out by Yuan Shikai, a warlord who fancied making himself the new emperor. But then Yuan died, and Dr. Sun returned from exile in Japan. But then Sun died. By the time the Japanese invaded Manchuria, Sun's successor at the head of the nationalists, the Kuomintang, was head of the government. His name was Chiang Kai-shek, and his hold on government depended on alliances and accommodations with factions and warlords, and on his being able to suppress the rising Chinese Communist Party, which had, in 1921, opened its first congress in the house of two party members. These were years in which those looking for proof that the weak could rise up and overthrow the privileged and corrupt had somewhere to look. They could look to Soviet Russia, and they did. They looked at propaganda from the factories and the collective farms. They looked at the parades and smiling faces, and they believed. One who read voraciously would absorb and then transform the theory behind the communist revolution was the son of a peasant from Hunan province. His name was Mao Zedong, and the story of how the war in China changed the world is also the story of how it transformed a supporting player in a minor political movement into one of the most influential politicians of the 20th century. From 1924, the Communist Party worked with and within the Nationalist Party. This so-called United Front was torn apart when Chiang Kai-shek's faction moved to suppress rising communist influence. By 1934, the party and the main part of its army had been driven into a retreat from the encirclement and violent opposition of the nationalists. This retreat to a remote part of the country is known to history as the Long March. The march took some of those involved as much as two years, covered more than 12,000 kilometers, and went through some of the least hospitable terrain in China. A main force reported at 130,000 broke out of the nationalist encirclement. They went west, then north. Between 25 and 30,000 people completed the journey. They reached Shanxi province, finally establishing in Yan'an the base that was to become famous, Red Yan'an, where the party could take stock and build the strength of its army. As historian Mark Selden has pointed out, the long march had not brought the surviving faithful to the promised land. It had rather, as Su Te Li, education commissioner in the communist administration, told the American journalist Edgar Snow, brought them to one of the darkest places on earth. Yan'an's remote and rugged character would be a benefit. Here, experiments could be conducted in education, culture, military tactics, land reform. A government in waiting could develop and test its theories. And emerging at the head of that government was Mao Zedong, who called the march the phenomenon of the great strategic shift. Mao had been elected chairman of the Chinese Soviet Republic in 1931. 
From that time, he would always be known as Mao Chusi, Chairman Mao. Less than three months after setting off on the march, he formally joined the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party and entered both its political and military core leadership. He would become chairman of the party's Politburo and Secretariat and remain in Shanxi until 1947, two years after the War of Resistance ended. He had been there for 13 years. The story of the war, of battles won and lost, guerrilla tactics and fearful suffering runs parallel in our narrative to the story of Yan'an, the years of experiment, of consolidation of power, of the development and promotion of policies and philosophies that became known as Mao Zedong thought. It is these two narratives together that describe the war that changed the world and tell us why it did. The full-scale war started a year after the end of the Long March in 1937, when the Communist Party's hopes of ever ruling China were virtually nil. Japanese military activity had not ended with the invasion of Manchuria, but Chiang Kai-shek, with a very realistic appraisal of the great gulf between Chinese and Japanese war readiness, and a commitment to defeating internal bandits, by which he meant the Communist Party, before turning to external ones, compromised and withdrew behind the slogan, resist foreign aggression after stabilizing the country. Many in Manchuria disagreed with Chang and the armies of the Northeast comprising elements from every part of the society, including the People's Revolutionary Army, continued the fight against Japan. Mao Zedong was one who saw things differently. He told Edgar Snow, we cannot even discuss communism if we are robbed of a country in which to practice it. The first of what was to be the almost endless stream of essays, lectures and editorials flowing from his brush in Yan'an demanded action, proposing the idea of a united front under the slogan, resist Japan and save the nation. On September 1st, 1936, the party's central committee issued a directive on forcing Chiang Kai-shek to face the Japanese. Its official slogan, resist Japan and oppose Chiang, was, under instructions from the Politburo, changed to compel Chiang Kai-shek to resist Japan. In November, forces from Inner Mongolia, supported by Japanese aircraft, tanks and artillery, cut the Beijing Sui Yuan Road, exposing the provinces of Shanxi and Shanxi to Japanese advance. Against this background, in December, Chang went to Xi'an to plan what he said would be the last five minutes of the bandit suppression campaign, meaning his campaign to destroy his communist opponents by military action. He was arrested by two of his own generals, Zhang Shuiliang and Yang Hucheng, who had become frustrated by their failure to persuade him to focus on the Japanese invader instead of the Communist Party, which said, the whole world rejoices about the arrest of the mother of all criminals. The solution to what has become known as the Xi'an incident was reached on Christmas Eve. Mao had decided that unity was the only way to resist the enemy and sent Cho En Lai to negotiate a settlement. The result was the establishment of a second united front, which the Communist Party had been proposing in speeches as far back as 1931, and which they offered to Chiang in a telegram in 1937. So, it was agreed that all parties would unite against the Japanese. For six months, the united front held 
and it may be that this was enough to persuade fiery elements within the Japanese army of occupation that they had better move quickly. An increase in the tempo of events occurred just outside Beijing, Beiping as it was then called, at a landmark whose beauty had been praised by Marco Polo, which is why the Lugo Cho incident is best known as the incident at the Marco Polo Bridge. It was July the 7th, 1937. Japanese troops stationed to protect the railway line were on maneuvers. Shots were fired. The Japanese commander claimed that one of his men was missing and demanded the right to search for him, which the local Chinese commander refused. And both sides faced the same choice, to pull back or to escalate. Chiang Kai-shek asked in his diary, is this the time to accept the challenge? A counterblow would not be easy in a region that was, according to historian Hans van der Ven, a frontier populated by private armies. Chiang ordered a general state of alert to prepare for resistance. The Japanese government sent reinforcements to China. Within two weeks, the Japanese had begun their advance. It would become the full-scale invasion designed to settle what the Japanese, who never declared war on China, called the North China Incident. Both the communists and nationalists reacted quickly after the Marco Polo Bridge incident. On July the 8th, the Chinese Communist Party issued a public telegraph stating that only by united resistance could China find its way out. It called on all Chinese people, armies and governments to unite together to build a great wall of an anti-Japanese invasion united front. On July 15th, the party delivered the declaration of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China to Chiang Kai-shek. And on the 17th, Chiang made a speech pointing out that the Marco Polo incident leaves no chance of making compromises. If we give up an inch of sovereignty or land, we would be sinners to all Chinese people. He said that we have hopes of solving the Marco Polo incident in a peaceful and diplomatic way, but added, if the war breaks out, then there is no difference between South or North, between old and young, between anyone. War broke out. The Japanese offensive began on July 26th. Beijing fell after two days and Tianjin two days after that. When the help he expected from Britain or America failed to materialize, the options available to Chiang Kai-shek as commander-in-chief did not include doing nothing. The Xi'an Agreement, his position, his popularity which was high, and the reality of Japan's advance on a north-south axis, threatening his capital of Nanjing, also known as Nanking, demanded a response. On July 31st, he said, since all hope for peace has been lost, all we can do now is resist to the bitter end. The Communist Party announced that all armies in the country, including the Red Army, support Mr. Chiang Kai-shek's declaration. Of the Red Army, American journalist Anna Louise Strong noted that most of the new recruits, like most Chinese peasants, were illiterate, but, she said, they were immediately taught to read and write. Chiang knew perfectly well that China was militarily outgunned. He estimated closing the gap with Japan would take some years. He hoped 
that he could absorb Japanese aggression using the scale of China's land and population. He called it trading space for time, and that he could hold the Japanese advance for long enough to relocate the government and crucial industries to safety in China's vast interior. He told the army that Japan wants a quick victory in a short war. We must therefore fight a protracted war of attrition. He decided to meet the Japanese advance in Shanghai. On August the 13th, 1937, small arms fire was heard in outer suburbs. It was about nine in the morning. The battle for Shanghai had begun. It would last for over three months. 700,000 Chinese and a little less than half that number of Japanese would be deployed. But the Japanese deficiency in manpower was compensated for elsewhere. 3,000 Japanese aircraft flew above the battle. 250 Chinese planes contested the skies. A hundred and thirty ships from the world's third most powerful navy lent support. They were faced by a navy which, as one historian noted, was incapable of stopping smugglers. There were more than 280,000 Chinese casualties. Less than 100,000 Japanese. A Chinese unit diary recorded intense Japanese artillery fire as if it would level the mountains and wipe out the sea. Shanghai falls in desolation after weeks of bombardment. Again and again, Japanese infantry storm the warehouse with rifles and machine guns. But still the suicide battalion fights on, its heroism admired by the work. In late October, Chinese forces began their withdrawal from the center of Shanghai. They had bought time, allowed for the removal of government and some industry, but the cost was high. Not just the casualties, but the destruction of much of Shanghai. A preview of Japanese tactics that included indiscriminate bombing and the use of gas the loss of the very best of nationalist Chinese units. Chang having decided to commit his elite divisions to the battle and the laying open of the road to Nanjing on which the Japanese now advanced towards a famously murderous bloodbath. In October 1937, the world's great powers gathered to discuss China's plight. The Nine Power Treaty Conference in Brussels. But the world was distracted by the rise of fascist dictators in Germany and Italy, and a civil war in Spain in which those same dictators were playing a role. German aircraft experimented with bombing techniques, famously at Guernica. Brutality on every side tore Spain apart for three years, and the international community was impotent. The Nine Power Treaty Conference met for the last time on November the 24th, just two days before the official end of the battle for Shanghai. The conference adjourned indefinitely, and the international community was impotent. It displayed again the timidity it had demonstrated when Italy had marched boldly into Ethiopia and defied the League of Nations calls for it to withdraw. During the battle for Nanjing, a Chinese officer recorded in his unit's diary, our artillery pieces were fired so intensely that their barrels were damaged. One or two exploded. It is difficult to win battles with weapons like that. 
the nationalist capital of Nanjing fell to the invader on December the 13th. For six weeks, the streets of the capital belonged to the troops of the Imperial Japanese Army. The exact death toll can never be known. 300,000 is the number given in the post-war trial of those responsible for an atrocity which some continue to deny. The dead were thrown into pits. The living were buried alive. The tortured and murdered were hurled into the river. Mutilated bodies were burned. Prisoners of war were killed. Civilians were killed. Women were raped and disfigured. Tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands. Such mayhem could not have occurred. It could certainly not have occurred in the Japanese army without approval from the chain of command. After the war, a Japanese officer in a testament in which he admitted to his role in numerous atrocities wrote, in times of peace, these acts would be totally unthinkable and inhuman. But in the strange environment of the battlefield, they are easy. Japan launched wars she could not win. Japan was small and under-resourced. She may have been more advanced than other Asian states, but on a global scale, she was, at best, emerging. Her dreams of conquest and expansion cost her more than 50% of the national budget spent on the military, a figure that rose to 70% before the war ended. Japan's hopes of victory lay not in conquest, but in surrender, in forcing the enemy into submission or at least peace talks. Japan would use what tactics she could to force the issue and terror unleashed on the population in the form of indiscriminate bombing, slaughter, chemical weapons, was an obvious tactic. In the last months of 1937, following the fall of Nanjing, the almost unopposed Japanese Air Force bombed more than 50 Chinese towns and cities in nine provinces many of the targets completely devoid of any tactical value. But China did not sue for peace. When in January 1938, the chairman and vice general commanding Shandong province abandoned his post in the face of the enemy, he was arrested, tried, made to kneel, and shot in the back of the head by a fellow general. Japan, expecting victory within six months, the more optimistic had suggested three months, was trapped in a long war without a strategy. Stalemated in China, she would, in the years ahead, gamble dangerously on the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere and fail disastrously. But that was years away. Shanxi province may have been far from the sound of the guns, but it too was at war with Japan, and in 1938, Mao Zedong would deliver a series of lectures that defined the Communist Party's approach to the war and became a Bible for those who, in the post-war years, fought guerrilla and revolutionary campaigns. As early as 1935, Mao had written that Japanese imperialism wants to turn China into a colony. He developed his thoughts in lectures he gave at the Red Army College, which was later renamed the Anti-Japanese Military and Political University. A pose fixed battle lines, he wrote. 
favor fluid battle lines, oppose the principle of maintaining one large rear area, and uphold the principle of small rear areas. On August 22, 1937, the Communist Party's Central Committee held an enlarged Politburo meeting at which it set out the policy that distinguished it from the Guomintang, the policy of a united front involving all the ethnic groups in China. In May of 1938, Mao would deliver the lectures on protracted war and problems of war and strategy. In protracted war, he said, the mobilization of the people throughout the country will create a vast sea in which to drown the enemy. And he saw the most practical path to mobilization, launch guerrilla warfare in the rear of the enemy, he said, and so secure overwhelming local superiority. In problems of war, he used a line that he had first used a decade earlier and that later generations of Maoist thinkers would quote, political power comes out of the barrel of a gun. By the time the lectures were delivered, Chinese forces had enjoyed some success against the invasion, notably at Pingxingwan and Taishuang. In 1937, the Red Army had been reorganized and renamed, becoming part of the Nationalist Army's order of battle. The main force of 46,000, it would grow enormously during the war, became the 8th Root Army. Other guerrilla units in the south were formed into the new 4th Army, with an initial strength of 10,000. By 1945, there were more than a million soldiers in the 8th Root Army and the population of the area they controlled had grown from one and a half million to almost a hundred million. Ping Xing Wan was an eighth route army ambush which trapped and destroyed a Japanese supply convoy in a deep gully. It was not a major battle or militarily significant, but it was a win. It boosted morale and showed that the Japanese were not invincible. You deserve praise and congratulations, said Chiang Kai-shek, the commander-in-chief. Taiya Xuan, fought at the beginning of April 1938, was a battle of a different order. There is an old railway station at Taiya Xuan, where the hands of the clock rest permanently at 12.20, the hour of the battle. Elements of the new 4th Army engaged the Itagaki Division of the Imperial Japanese Army. One Chinese estimate states that 11,000 Japanese were lost and acknowledges 7,500 casualties on its side. Other figures are lower, some higher, as many as 15 to 20,000 casualties on each side. For Taiyuang, as for much else in the China theater, it is difficult to find agreement on the data. What is not in dispute is that some of the casualties were victims of weapons forbidden under the Geneva Convention, to which Japan was signatory. The enemy in the Fanxia district, wrote Liu Binghuan, a nationalist officer, is using massive amounts of poison gas. To conceal their actions, the Japanese referred to the gas as special smoke. Victory at Taishuang did not stem the Japanese advance, and it did not dwell long in the consciousness of the world. Exactly a week after Taishuang, the world's attention was distracted by the Anschluss, Germany's annexation of Austria. Germany moves into Austria. And these pictures will perhaps stir emotions in some of you which you may find it hard to repress. But sit through them calmly. They will teach us something, they will illustrate the seriousness of the times in which we live, and they will reinforce our determination to meet the difficulties of our world with courage. Approved by 99% of the population of Austria in a referendum, the annexation erased from the map a nation that had for centuries been the seat of power in Central Europe. 
It was not Hitler's first territorial gain. It would not be his last. The following month, Mao delivered his On Protracted War lectures. The war between China and Japan is not just any war, Mao said. It is specifically a war of life and death between semi-colonial and semi-feudal China and imperialist Japan. Mao correctly anticipated Japan spreading into the greater part of Chinese territory south of the Great Wall. But he also saw that the enemy can actually hold only the big cities, the main lines of communication, while the greater part will be taken up by the guerrilla areas. The nature of Japan's occupation, restricted by the size of her army and the scale of Chinese territory, has become known as points and lines. Japan occupied strategic points and the lines of communication, especially the railroads that linked them, which left vast areas of hostile territory, where mainly communist forces established bases and conducted guerrilla operations. Chinese historians call these areas the backstage battlefield. Following the loss of Nanjing, Chang temporarily relocated his capital to Wuhan, and this city now came under pressure. On June the 9th, Chiang Kai-shek issued an order designed to slow the Japanese advance. He ordered the dike holding the Yellow River at Huayuangko to be breached, and 300,000 square kilometers of his country to be flooded. No warning was given. It would have alerted the Japanese to the plan. He succeeded in briefly impeding the Japanese advance in an action that caused many deaths. How many? They're too familiar with death and tragedy in China. The numbers are never reliable. Perhaps 800,000. The nationalist government withdrew from Wuhan to establish itself in a place the only real appeal of which was that it was as out of the way as a capital city could be, Chongqing. Japan, by now, was in possession of probably more than it expected, and all that it wanted. It had the greater part of the fertile eastern and northern regions of China, in addition to the northeast, which it had already colonized. It enjoyed control of all the major cities and excellent ports, by the time it occupied Hainan Island in February of 39, it would be in a position to enforce a naval blockade of the whole country. Leaders of the Chinese United Front predicted a war in three parts. The defensive, the strategic stalemate, the counter-offensive. By this definition, Mao Zedong's analysis of protracted war, the conflict was entering the stalemate stage. The stalemate was perhaps a pause as people waited to see how things would develop in Europe, where great powers had rolled over in the face of Hitler's threats and sacrificed Czechoslovakia at Munich. Within the Führerhaus, the camera is present to record for the waiting world and for posterity the scenes of deliberation. There is no large, long table with chairman and rules of procedure. These leaders of mankind stand around discussing the problems which affect the destiny of all humanity with the informality and directness reminiscent of a school study. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's shuttle diplomacy, his apparent trust in the word of a gentleman who was not a gentleman, has made him a figure viewed by some as profoundly comic, by others as profoundly tragic. Of his appeasement policy, Mao Zedong said it was like lifting a stone only to drop it on one's own toes. Mao, steadily rising to the top of the party structure, delivered the closing address at the Central Committee's sixth plenary session. 
In the anti-Japanese war, he said, regular warfare is primary and guerrilla warfare supplementary. For only regular warfare can decide the final outcome of the war. But he understood where the Communist Party could play the most valuable role and gain the greatest support. Through guerrilla warfare, Mao said, explaining one of the great insights of Mao Zedong thought, we shall build up our strength and turn ourselves into a decisive element in the crushing of Japanese imperialism. The main Japanese offensive, as 1938 drew to a close, would be directed at Wuhan. But the guerrilla bases in the north were not left unmolested. In September, 25 columns of the Imperial Japanese Army moved to encircle eight fruit army bases in three provinces, Shanxi, Chaha, and Hebei. In a 48-day campaign, the eighth fruit army managed to extricate itself and dividing into smaller units of one or 2,000 to harass the Japanese in hundreds of small actions. The new fourth army similarly disrupted activity behind Japanese lines and nationalist forces also attempted guerrilla tactics, though with less success than their communist allies. The Chinese defense of Wuhan was supported by volunteer pilots from the Soviet Air Force. Their contribution, ordered by Stalin, was a material benefit to the Chinese cause. That cause was damaged when Stalin withdrew all support on signing his non-aggression pact with Japan in 1941. Despite a desperate defense and heavy casualty toll on both sides, Wuhan fell in October, as did Guangzhou. Chang moved his capital to Chongqing, and the Japanese held their ground. This was the strategic stalemate during which the Japanese groomed their puppets. Japan's best strategy for managing the lands she had conquered was to rule through proxies. She had set up effective puppet regimes in the territories she occupied and put significant effort into doing the same in China. Her best option was a man named Wang Jingwei and in later war years, he would indeed lead a puppet regime. As 1938 ended, the playwright Tian Han, who wrote the lyrics for 1934's March of the Volunteers, which became and remains the national anthem of the People's Republic, wrote a verse summarizing how he saw the war. With 400 million actors, and a front of 10,000 li. The globe itself, as an audience, watches our great historical drama. The war in China entered its third year, but it was a year in which the war would begin to change. In 1939, Europe burst into flames. <laughs>